we have 12 webinars scheduled for the year, all free for members of MSHS. Please check out our website for topics and more information. And now I would like to introduce our speaker, Larry Cipolla. Larry is a Hennepin County Master Gardener, international speaker, longtime gardener, and hydroponic expert. He's the author of the book, Hydroponic Gardening, The Very Easy Way, which we do have for sale here at the MSHS office. It will also be available for purchase at our booths at the Spring Home and Garden Shows. We are grateful that he's taken time out of his schedule to present tonight. Thank you, Larry. Take it away. Thank you, Deborah. Appreciate it. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you all for uh, signing up um, for this webinar on hydroponics. Again, specifically, we're going to be talking about hydroponic gardening, the very easy way. Uh, the focus for tonight's session is really for you, I hope, the homeowner versus the the, the, um, the commercial user. So if you're um, interested in hydroponics and uh, want to um, learn about a, a system that's uh, fairly easy to uh, implement, then, then you've signed up for the right course. I'll be describing a passive deep water culture system that does not require pumps or air stones. The deep water culture system that I will share with you is the lowest cost and easiest hydroponic system to set up and maintain. It's 100% portable and expandable. Uh, my intent is to have you seriously consider hydroponics for year-round gardening, uh, just as I do 12 months out of the year, winter, spring, summer, and fall. And now, if uh, most of you are from Minnesota or certainly in, in Zone 4, where it's a little bit chilly outside, having fresh greens um, and, and even tomatoes um, uh, for your salad and for your dinner is, is really a treat. Hydroponically, you can grow any salad green and, and other plant varieties that produce fruit, such as tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, and cucumbers, as well as flowers and herbs. Uh, you can use containers, the system I'm about ready to describe to you, um, uses containers as small as one half gallon and also larger containers such as five gallon buckets or 10 gallon totes or even um, food safe PVC tubes that are four inches in diameter by 10 feet. So the system is extremely expandable and uh, really uh, suited to you for how, uh, how how much you want to get involved in it. You can grow your own fr fresh veggies and herbs without the need for pesticides or herbicides. So you can say goodbye to E. coli and other bacterial nasties. Um, there are minimal tools required. Uh, in some cases, I'll show you one example where no tools are required and really no gardening experience is needed. So if, you're, if you've been gardening as I have for, for a lot of years, um, great. But if you have not, then hydroponics is, is uh, really um, no big deal. Um, as Deb, Deborah said, uh, I really invite you to purchase my book, Hydroponic Gardening, The Very Easy Way, um, on Amazon.com or through tonight's uh, fantastic host, the Minnesota Horticultural Society and Northern Garden Magazine. Uh, my book will provide you with more in-depth information for what we're going to cover tonight and really provide you with a step-by-step -step approach to the world of hydroponics, um, the deep water culture way. What I'd like you to do is, as Deborah has already mentioned, um, please submit your questions and concerns um, as we're going through. We'll, we'll answer as many as we can towards the end. And um, I'd also like to know um, who among you have a hydroponic system now. You know, is this the first first exposure, or have you been doing it for quite a while? Well, with that said, um, let's talk about uh, what is hydroponics. And if I can um, start with this, um, the, the, your first slide. Um, really, hydroponic gardening is a, is a method, as you can see here, uh, for growing plants in water without soil. Uh, no soil at all. And it's a very old system. Um, Babylon, the Aztecs from Mexico, Chinese, uh, the ancient Egyptians, all have used different kinds of um, hydroponic gardens, hanging gardens from Babylon, for example, is just one example. And now as we speak, uh, NASA, and I do have a slide, by the way, from NASA, they are growing potatoes in outer space um, or trying to to see if that is a viable food source for ast astronauts in the future. Um, so it's in outer space. In Arctic, uh, the Arctic and Antarctica, uh, different uh, companies, different countries, even uh, the Norwegians and Germans, for example, are growing fresh vegetables 
in in enclosures, of course, you know, in, in enclosed areas for, to protect from the cold weather, um, rather than ship all that stuff in from Australia or, or wherever they get it from. So it's really kind of cool to see how it's growing. Again, as I, I mentioned earlier, it's, this is a passive or a static deep water culture system. And again, what that means is the water does not move. And we'll talk more about um, uh, why that works uh, with the system that we're going to talk about. And again, as I said, it's the easiest to set up, least expensive. You don't have to worry about tubing or pumps or electricity. And you can almost set it and forget it. it it's really a, a really a low maintenance system. And as I mentioned, um, you know, you can use standard buckets that you can get at any um, Home Depot or, or, or garden center and really no uh, garden experience is needed. I first learned about um, hydroponics. Um, I, I had a different company, a consulting company, leadership consulting company. So I've traveled all over the world. And on one of my visits to Singapore, um, um, sort of changing hats here. Um, I, I, I made friends with the, the director of the uh, botanical gardens. So he would take me around to the different schools that were growing and using hydroponics for the students so they can have fresh vegetables in, um, for lunch, for example. And if any of you are familiar with Singapore, there's really no land or farms as, as we know it here in the United States and certainly not in Minnesota. Um, most of the so-called community gardens or plots there are extremely small. And I'm talking about maybe a meter by two or three meters uh, uh, long. So, so they're pretty small. And what you're seeing on the left side uh, of, of this frame is, <clears throat> excuse me, is the styrofoam units that they were selling to the residents of Singapore so they can do, do hydroponics uh, in, indoors, you know, in their own condos and their houses and so forth. Um, if any of you have raised tomatoes, I'll focus your attention now on the on the the other photograph here. I'd be curious to know what um, what's the distance that uh, you use between each each tomato in a row, uh, one foot, two foot, three foot, whatever. Here you're seeing hydroponics, and I hope you can see the root system here. The spacing of these tomatoes is four inches apart. There is no soil-based system that you can identify, including square foot gardening, where you can get this much uh, productivity in such a small space. And the reason why you can do that and the reason why uh, this form of hydroponics is pretty popular is because when you first start out, on the, if you'll notice the, the, the image on the left-hand side, the, um, uh, the plant and its container, a net pot, for example, the, the yellow that you see, hopefully you, you can see this in color, um, the water is just touching the bottom of that net pot. So the root system, as small as they are, starts to draw in the nutrient solution. And nutrient solution is just straight water and a, a hydrogen, or excuse me, a hydroponic fertilizer that I'll talk about in a bit. As the plant grows, the plant takes in more of that nutrient solution and expands that airspace. Plants do not grow in dirt. They do not grow in soil. Uh, they grow in air. So when uh, you have a, a house plant that you, for some reason, it looks a little weepy, uh, your first inclination is to do what? Probably needs water, so you water it. Well, the next day or two, it looks even worse. So what do you do? In all probability, you add water. What you're doing is taking the air out. You're suffocating the plant. Here, as you can see, the, the volume of water um, uh, drop that volume of air increases and that sustains the root system. And, and, um, and uh, that, so basically you can grow almost anything that you want. Several advantages, as I mentioned, flexibility. Yes, you can dazzle your friends with your new expertise. Growing stuff in water, give me a break. Yeah, you can do that. Scientifically, um, some of the universities who, have, who are involved in hydroponics are claiming that plant growth is at least 30 to 50% higher. The taste and texture is exactly the same as in the soil. Uh, your soil, uh, whether it's sand and anoka or, or clay uh, where I live, yes, that can influence the taste. Okay, but all things being equal, the taste and texture is, is pretty much uh, uh, the same. And um, part of the reason why you get that higher growth is because in a soil based garden, the plant, the root system has to search for the food. 
So you will almost always see the roots, if you, if you dig up a plant, growing horizontally. Yes, they grow down a little bit, but they also grow horizontally, and, and they're trying to pick up the nutrients, and that sustains them, that helps them grow. Hydroponically, the roots are in the fertilizer or the nutrient solution 100% of the time. They don't have to search anywhere. So if you lift lifted up a, um, a net pot or a pot uh, with a plant in it hydroponically, all of those roots are going to be vertical. Uh, they're going to be straight down because that's uh, that's where their food source is. Now, there are lots of disadvantages, and, and just to be fair, uh, I should point them out. Uh, there's no shovels, rakes, or rotor tilling involved. You don't haul heavy bags of compost or fertilizer around. Uh, you don't have to worry about a sore back or hips or knees uh, going out on you because there's really no heavy lifting with uh, hydroponic gardening. And for those of you who like pets, Sorry, but you will not see earwigs or slugs or wireworms or other little creepy things uh, that uh, kind of manage to crawl up your elbow to your elbow um, in hydroponic gardening. There is no such thing as spring preparation or winterizing your garden. Sure, I have to, um, uh, now I'm growing things in my basement, uh, you know, I, I garden year round. And so when I'm done with that, I, I do clean them out, clean out the totes. Okay, so that's a little bit of preparation. But basically, I'm just taking a container empty container from my basement to the outside, fill it up with a nutrient solution again, add my plants, and that's it. So there's no dirt under your fingernails. And quite frankly, um, you and your friends may agonize over, you know, is this really organic? And is this, the, is this what I should really be doing um, instead of soil-based gardening? Um, and we can talk a little bit about whether it's organic or not towards the end. Here are some of the common tools that you may need. And what you're looking at in the upper left-hand and lower left-hand corners are the only tools that you will need generally in, in the system that I'm uh, about to, uh, to present to you. You will need a drill. And in the, in the lower left-hand corner, you're seeing something called a two-inch hole saw, H-O-L-E, hole saw, that um, cuts the holes in the covers of your 10-gallon tote for example, that you see in the upper right-hand corner, or you can drill holes in the cover of your five-gallon or six-gallon bucket. You see that in the bottom. And in the middle, center, top, these are the two-inch net pots, and they are filled with a, a, a substrate, perlite and peat. We'll talk more about that later. That's where your seed goes. That's where your plant goes. And as the roots come through those slots, that's how they come in contact with the nutrient solution. So it's really nothing you have to do. And, and I'll show you how you, you can direct seed uh, into these net pots so, so you don't have to transfer or move things around any more than you have to. But the drill is, um, that will be your biggest expense for tool-wise. And my suggestion is that if you're going to do any drilling, that you have a nice uh, piece, a two-inch piece of scrap wood underneath because if you uh, feel like drilling those holes and you're on your favorite living room table or dining room table uh, someone you live with may get a little upset if you start marking it up so so put a, a piece of uh, scrap lumber, lumber under there to protect it you can also graze uh, raise vegetables and herbs and flowers in pvc tubes uh, these are uh, these just happen to be um, four inch in diameter, 24 inches long, and I can get uh, five plants in uh, each of these tubes. Um, if you don't want to buy a drill, if you don't want to buy any tools, what you can do is to raise pretty much everything you want in a five or six gallon bucket, actually even smaller buckets, and then buy what's called a wide lip basket. These baskets are roughly maybe about a six or seven dollar. Uh, uh, cost. They fit over any standard three and a half to six gallon bucket. So you can snap them on or what I do is just set them on there and you're done. There's no drilling. There's, there's no nothing to tie them down. Um, so if you don't have a drill, don't want to be bothered with a drill or you're afraid to use a drill, I would suggest that you go with a five gallon bucket option and these uh, wide lip baskets. For those of you who are handy and know a little bit about welding, um, you can either make a, a rebar vertical um, frame, such as uh, this is my backyard, uh, or make it out of wood, of course. But instead of growing horizontally as you might in your soil-based garden, grow vertically. 
So here I can get uh, 27 to 36 plants in the space. Off my deck, I've got uh, at least two of the. I got have several of these in my um, in my yard, uh, but here I can get the 44 plants per unit in a footprint that's only 12 inches deep and 36 inches long. Uh, so it's very efficient as far as um, uh, volume goes, and you know how much product you can grow in um, in these tubes, for example. The uh, as you look at the tubes, you'll notice that some are black or black ends and so forth. Um, I have a lot of these in my yard, and the end caps are, are probably more expensive than the PVC tube, quite frankly. So um, I cut out um, clear plastic uh, windows, and I glued them in the end. So when I walk by my unit, instead of lifting up the plant to check the water level or, or whatever, I just take a peek in, on each end, see what the water level is. If it's um, high enough, sufficient, I walk away. And, or, or not, then I otherwise fill it up. So, so those are uh, clear plastic windows that you're seeing there. When you buy a container, when you use a container, only use containers that are food safe and only containers that have these numbers. My preference is the number two, which is a, a certain kind of... Um, of uh, plastic, if you will, uh, resin, if you will, but that's totally food safe. And if you really wanted to, you can stick that kind of plastic um, in a microwave, uh, uh, put hot water in it, put freezing cold water in it, and so forth and so on, and it's not going to um, fool around. It's not going to deteriorate on you. Um, but all of these numbers are good. So when you go to, for example, a, a garden center and you and you look, at, uh, you want to buy a tote or or a bucket. On the bottom, you will see either this number, one of these numbers, or the, one of these symbols. And uh, that'll tell you that it's food safe and, and, and uh, okay to use. Here's some estimated costs that you um, uh, may want to take a peek at. I use all of these buckets, totes, PVC tubes, and so forth and so on. You may not. You may want to start with a, a bucket, for example. And um, if you if you buy a bucket in let's say a, a garden center, it comes with a cover, and make sure you get the cover. Uh, they 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 aren't supposed to charge you for that. And those buckets range anywhere from three to five dollars, uh, you know, depending on if the if the um, if the company has their name on it or whatever. But that's pretty low rent. And then if you if you do get a uh, a bucket with a cover, um, if you don't want to use the cover because you don't want to use a drill. Then as you look at the bottom, go, you get a wide lip basket. They come in sizes 6, 8, or 10-inch diameter. They fit, uh, that's the in, in, internal uh, inside diameter. And they fit over, as I said earlier, any standard bucket. And they, again, run about 5 or $8. If you choose buckets, I'm not going to tell you where I get my free buckets, but make friends with uh, your local um, bakery your grocery store that maybe has a, a bakery, um, some of the coffee shops uh, around the metro area, and, and actually anywhere, but um, they are not allowed to resell or reuse their buckets. All, all the frosting uh, and a lot of the uh, egg yolks and egg whites and, and, and even uh, flour now comes in buckets, and that's to protect it from mice and rats and other kind of critters. Well, once that's used, they give them away or they toss them away. So um, I have a favorite manager in one of my grocery stores. I call him up Friday morning. Uh, he starts work at 3 o'clock, so I usually hit him about 6 o'clock in the morning, say, I need X number of buckets. Here are the sizes I need. What do you got for me? Anything? Sure. Come by Monday morning before 7 o'clock and take your pick. And I walk away with a free bucket, a free cover, and then uh, I have the wide lip basket. So I can get involved in the system if you want, for just the price of a wide lip basket. So, so again, as I said way back when, it, it's really economical if, if uh, that's what you want to get involved in. Other costs, these are what I call your ongoing costs, hydroponic fertilizer. You cannot use soil-based fertilizer, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a second. Uh, but you can use hydroponic fertilizer for hydroponics and outdoors on any of your plants, whether they're herbs, flowers, or vegetables. Uh, and I'll, I'll mention why in just a bit. You also, uh, my recommendation is you also buy something called perlite, which is a natural volcanic glass. It, it's a rock that they process, uh, peat, 
Um, for those of you who drink scotch, that's um, that scotch was uh, whiskey was filtered through peat. Another natural material uh, was fairly new on the market. Maybe in the last several years is something called coconut uh, core. Uh, it's recy recycled coconut fiber. Um, a little bit to me, a little bit more expensive than uh, peat, but it works uh, pretty well. It, uh, the pH is um, is is uh, pretty constant. It, it changes the the water pH just a tad, but nothing to get concerned about. You can also use something called Rockwell cubes uh, to start your seeds, and then um, a lot of times in my buckets, in the wide the baskets, just to support the stem of the plant, uh, you know, the base of the plant. I'll I'll pack it with either straight perlite or what's called leco. These are clay pellets. Again, a natural product. They're heated into these little round balls that you can um, use as well. So that's pretty easy to do. Starting your seeds. Several methods. Um, I use a mix of perlite, 80% to 20% either peat or core. And I pack those in two inch net pots and you're seeing um, you're seeing that uh, net pot. I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but this is the net pot. It's filled with a perlite peat mix and um, add your seeds and you're done. What you're seeing here just for demonstration purposes on the left hand corner is one net pot in filled with perlite peat. Seeds are in there, but then uh, and I can get up to 40 of these two inch net pots in a standard 1020 uh, seed starting tray. I can get 40 seeds in there, but on the long one long side and one short side, I usually pack that with perlite so the so the net pots don't shift around because I'm always lifting the the trays up and moving them around, doing whatever I'm doing. So I don't want them to tip over. So you can just pack them with the perlite, uh, as you see here. The, the photograph on the left is a little bit overkill, but just to emphasize, the perlite is 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 very light. It's uh, uh, I mean, it weighs almost nothing. Uh, it just supports the net pot. I direct seed in these net pots, and as the as the plant grows, uh, as you can see on the right hand side, roughly when it's about two inches tall, and and especially when the root system has penetrated the net pots, then I transfer it to my bucket or my tote or whatever I'm going to um, you know, keep it in. Fertilizers. All fertilizers hydroponic or otherwise, include NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, or potassium in this order. Uh, every every bag of fertilizer, you'll see these a, a series of numbers, three numbers in exactly this order. That first number means always means nitrogen. And if there's a, a second number, that's uh, phosphorus and then potassium. The amount of nutrient, um, and, and these, are, um, uh, these are granular or dry nutrient um, uh, uh, mixes. And what, the, what it means is when you see a number that says, for example, 10, 10, 10, what that means is there are 10 pounds of nitrogen in this bag per 100 pounds, or sometimes it's a percentage, or it means it's 10% of, of the volume in this bag is nitrogen and, and so forth and so on. So if you're going to raise salad greens, the leaves that you're going to eat, and you know, versus a fruit like a tomato, you want that first number nitrogen to be fairly high or higher than the other two. And that'll promote all kinds of what we call vegetative growth. Below what I just said and vegetative growth, uh, expanding on that just a little bit. Again, if you want leaves and for early growth of any plant, my suggestion is again, you get a fertilizer, hydroponic fertilizer only, <clears throat> where that first number is a little bit higher. And there are many, many different companies out, and I've just listed just three here. I'm familiar with all three. I use all three on occasion. Um, but General Hydro, Hydroponics and Supernatural and so forth, uh, Jax, uh, they have a wide range of fertilizers to choose from. But notice the different mixes, nitrogen 10 percent for general hydro, uh, hydroponics, uh, supernaturals 11. Oasis I like, uh, especially for lettuces, it's got a very high or higher nitrogen count, 16 percent, or if, it's, if it was a dry fertilizer, 16 pounds per 100 pounds in that particular bag. So, so you get a little uh, a quicker growth. Are we talking about months here? No. But maybe it, you're going to be able to, to harvest a week earlier, for example, with some of these higher uh, nitrogen counts. You can stop here with the vegetative growth 
fertilizers and use it forever, you know, for, for your whole growing season. Uh, you don't have to switch off. Some people, uh, and me included, uh, will switch off for to encourage blooms for flowers or fruit if I'm working planting tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, eggplants, and so forth. Um, then what I will do is to stop using the vegetative growth, empty out my container, you know, add fresh water, always cold water, never warm water. Cold water has more uh, oxygen in it than, than warm water. And now I'm going to switch to some of the bloom or fruit production kinds of fertilizers. General Hydro Hydroponics has something called Maxi Bloom. That's just one of their many products. Oasis, uh, which usually, Oasis is marketed commercially under that name. Um, for non-commercial, it's usually um, called Jax, but you can buy this on the internet and so forth. But notice the middle number. Less nitrogen, much more phosphorus. That produces your flower. That produces your fruit. That makes a bigger flower or a more vibrant flower or, or ideally even sometimes a bigger um, a, a bigger tomato, for example. The last one, hula bloom. Um, I should put a, a, an asterisk on here. Um, uh, basically, use with caution. And uh, I don't know if there are any um, women out in the audience, uh, and I don't mean to be chauvinistic here, but ladies, I'm going to ask you to do what all of us men do. Please read the instructions. Um, I always read the instructions, especially after I've screwed something up and I say, oh, that's what I should have done. Look at the mix for hula bloom. Notice the phosphorus. There's no nitrogen at all. 50-30 uh, for uh, uh, phosphorus and potassium. You're using a half teaspoon per five gallons. Now, that's some pretty potent stuff. There is no soil-based fertilizer that, that I think you can name that is, has this potency, but it is, um, it is a winner. It, um, it, it, you know, if you follow the instructions, and, and compared to the, other, um, to the other fertilizers that you see here, one or two teaspoons per gallon, that's still pretty good. If you're familiar with uh, miracle Grow, you're using a tablespoon per gallon. Here, maybe you're using a teaspoon or possibly a, a tape, one tablespoon um, per gallon in some cases, or up to. And the reason why I've, I've sometimes changed it, especially Jack's Bloom, um, a half a teaspoon per gallon, you can work up to a full tablespoon or a full tablespoon as the plant matures. But you have to be careful because, you know, if you put too much fertilizer in too soon, you'll burn the plant and, and, and it will die. And, and that's really what happened to me with hula bloom. So I don't mean to be cute when I say read the instructions. I was growing uh, five tomato plants uh, on my deck. Uh, in, uh, last summer, and um, they were doing great. And I said, well, I think I'll switch out. I added hula bloom. I read the instructions, a half a teaspoon per five gallons. I said, oh, come on, give me a break. So, I mean, what can an extra half a teaspoon um, hurt? Within one week, the plants let me know how much it hurt because they all died. I, I, I burnt all five plants and I basically had to start over. And for those of you who raise tomatoes, you know, it takes a long time to germinate and get up. So it really kind of ticked me off, but my fault. And, but, uh, but these are just some examples of the, of the fertilizers you can use. And to repeat, any hydroponic fertilizer can be used outdoors in any plant that you have outdoors, flowers, herbs, uh, vegetable garden, whatever. Here's why <clears throat> hydroponic fertilizer is, um, is, is very complete and, and uh, much more um, uh, effective, I guess, than, than a soil-based garden, because it has typically all anywhere from 13 to 16 elements, depends on um, uh, what, what uh, research paper you're looking at, but it has at least the, the, you know, uh, 14, 12 to 14, uh, and you're seeing them listed here uh, on your slide. Uh, so it's a very complete fertilizer. You do not have to add any other additives if you do not want to. So if you, if you buy a complete uh, new hydroponic fertilizer, that's it. You're, you're not spending any more money on any, um, any additives if, if you don't uh, want to do that. Root system. As I mentioned earlier, 
Once those roots emerge from uh, this, uh, in the upper left-hand corner uh, 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 is what's called rock wool cubes. Uh, they have a, they, they're all connected. They usually come in a sheet of about 96, I believe. Um, and they come in different sizes, one inch or, or inch and a half or two inches. Uh, these, I believe, are one inch size. Um, but I put one, one or two seeds in the depression, let it germinate, let it grow. And usually I, I, I cut out the weakest um, a plant. Cut, do not pull, because then you'll rip out the roots of the, of the plant you want to save. But then when, once you see the roots emerging, then you can put it in your tote or your bucket or you know where, whatever container you have. On the right side, upper, here's, some, here's an example of radicchio, um, roots coming through a, a, a two-inch net pot. And uh, when they do, again, I, you, know, you just put it in your 10-gallon your tote or, again, whatever system you have. Lower right-hand uh, corner, I got to play a little bit. I, I do a lot of uh, experimenting. And here you see these are Asian greens. This is called um, spicy green mustard. Got just a little bit of kick to it, not too bad. Um, and just for the heck of it, I kept it in my perlite tray uh, way past I should have. <clears throat> Plant was growing great. But notice um, how the, the perlite is, is clinging to the root system. Okay, the plant didn't die, and it doesn't hurt the plant, really. So what I did was to take this um, uh, root system and just gently kind of squish it a little bit so the perlite uh, uh, fell off. And is, here you can see the root system. It's about nine inches. Stick it back in the hole, and, and it's good to go. Um, but again, as soon as those roots break through, you're good to go. <coughs> Excuse me. And yes, if you do not start your own seeds, you can cheat, as I call it, with store-bought plants. Um, my suggestion is that you buy um, plants earlier in the season, nice and green, nice and healthy looking, and small. Maybe about six inches, but certainly not more than nine inches. You don't want to buy a plant that's a foot or two or, or whatever. Um, it, it just is not going to do well for you. But you buy the plant. Remove as much of the soil as, as you can, and, and my method is to is to take the plant by the leaves, never by the stem, because you may constrict the the, um, the vascular system and the stem, and and, uh, and and it won't take up the nutrient uh, as well as it should. So you take it by the leaves, and I, I dip it in lukewarm water and try to get out as much of the soil as possible. 100% probably not. 99% uh, sure. Once the soil is out, then I'll stick it in my two-inch net pot or my wide lip basket or you know wherever I want to have it to live for the rest of the growing season, and I'm done. So if you start your own seeds, easy to do. Direct seed them right into your two-inch net pot or your rock wool cubes, done. Or don't want to be bothered with that. Go out and uh, you know buy the plants, uh, take off the soil, and um, grow them hydroponically from that um, point on. What can you grow? I think I said earlier, almost anything. Here's one example. This is in my basement. Uh, in the front, and by the way, the the um, the little pebbles that you see here, that, that's the clay pellets, the LECA, L-E-C-A, that I use um, for some of these wider um, um, containers just to support the plant. But here you, I'm growing aloe. Uh, this is a succulent. This is a, a type of a cactus, if you will. Whoever heard of growing a succulent, a cactus type plant in water. Here you, here's one example. And this plant that I now have in uh, my dining room, uh, excuse me, in my um, uh, eating area of the dining room, um, this is it's on uh, one full year, about 18 months now, it's uh, over two feet high. So yes, you can raise succulents. On the right side, chards. Swiss chard, if, if uh, those of you who eat that. Behind it is sage. Behind that is cilantro and Italian parsley. I've got some coleus uh, flowers also growing in here. And off to the side, in buckets, uh, are, are some of my tomatoes that um, I, I, I grow every winter uh, along with my salad greens. Um, so if you want to raise flowers and don't want to be bothered with any vegetables, uh, again, um, to me, coleus and geraniums and whatever, pretty easy to do, um, uh, and, um, and and they grow very, very well hydroponically, quite frankly. 
Here's some more coleus. Here's lantana and a, and a couple other uh, types in the back that you, you can't see. But um, I have start, I start my flowers, or if I want to do flowers, with a single leaf. I dip it in root tone, put it in my hydroponic uh, perlite peat mix, my net pot, and, and top water it and, you know, until the root system catches. And then once the root system, as you saw earlier, you know, it gets, uh, once those roots go through those slots, I put it, and this is, these are 10 gallon totes, and I just let them go crazy. And I can keep them growing hydroponically if I want. Or a lot of times what I will do is if they get a little too big, as in 12 inches or 18 inches, I'll take them out of the um, the um, tote or wherever I'm growing them, and I'll put them in a, in a, a dirt base, soil base container out of my, um, you know, on my deck or whatever. You can almost always go from a hydroponic, don't, don't remove the net pot, just net pot and all, plant and all, and plant it in your yard, in your garden, in a container, you know, use potting soil and so forth and so on. The reverse is much tougher because if you try to dig out a plant, let's say a parsley plant, root system is pretty extensive. You probably, in fact, on all probability, you will never be able to get the entire root system and you might kind of rip too many of the roots out and therefore destroy the plant. Uh, so it, it, it'll, it'll be stunted. You may not kill it, but it will not grow that well for you. But you can go hydroponic to soil, but not always the reverse. <clears throat> and if you grow beets, turnips, Kohlrabi, my bet is if you do, you have never ever seen the beet or the turnip or the kohlrabi growing totally out of the ground. Yes, you've seen the shoulder of the beet or the turnip and so forth, but never the, the, the whole um, uh, basically root that you're eating. So what I do with things like kohlrabi, beets, and turnips, as, they're, as the plant is growing and as it's young, I strip out the outer leaves, you know, three or four per plant, depends on, on, the, on the maturity of the plant. And I, I, I'll add those to my salad or I'll stir fry those, or whatever, but I'll get multiple crops out of that. So I keep harvesting the leaves until there's a certain point. I say, okay, that's enough that the stems are starting to get a little woody or the stems are starting to get a little uh, tough or whatever, whatever. And then I just let the plant grow. And so it forms the, uh, you know, the, the root that you see here. And then I harvest the, the, the whole thing at the end of the season. You can raise radishes. You can raise carrots. The problem with carrots, um, only raise those varieties that are maybe four or six inches long at the longest. And the reason for that is, first of all, they, you can't you can't grow them in a two-inch net pot. You can only grow them, for example, uh, in my in my system, in a wide lip basket. Well, that wide lip basket is only about uh, four or five inches deep. So a very long carrot is going to bend and get all cockeyed on you uh, and really really not do well. But some of the French varieties that are only two inches, three inches, maybe four inches, uh, they can do pretty well in there. Green onions or scallions, as some people call them, uh, uh, onion sets, they grow pretty uh, pretty easily hydroponically. And here you're seeing uh, one of my Japanese red turnips in a two-inch net pot. And um, it's kind of fun um, to, to see this grow. Uh, I do a lot of teaching with kids. And for them, it's kind of fascinating for them to not only see this, but in the next couple slides, you'll see um, the root system. And they're kind of fascinated by um, they started the seed, they let it grow, they, they took care of it, now they're ready to harvest it, and then the teacher will have them basically harvest the entire plant and examine the root system. And so it's a great uh, learning experience for, for kids um, and, and adults if you're into roots anyway. Here, this is my own tomato variety called Sepulchus Pride. Uh, they, the three of these babies are growing in five gallon buckets, no big deal, um, and I have them on my deck. Um, these are heirloom. If I let them, they will grow over eight feet tall. So um, even though my favorite wife is not too excited about having me use my um, deck railing as a trellis, uh, that's what is going on in my yard. And um, so they do need support. But as you can see, I hope they look uh, pretty vibrant. And, um, um, you know, you, you you get a halfway decent crop out of them. Um, what you're seeing here in all of these, Jeff, you can see the, the white, 
That's the perlite. Normally, I would put a peat, or excuse me, a, a clay pellets in here, uh, but this year I used 100% perlite just to support the plant. And uh, and the root system, of course, is in the bucket, and the the, the plants are doing great. If you really are talented, talent impaired, like I am, uh, you can go the cheapo route and forget the um, the rebar or wood vertical frames and uh, some of the other uh, things that you may see on the internet. Um, I've gone, I, I go to a garden center. I buy the resin uh, saw horses. Usually they come in pairs of two, uh, you know, a pair of two. Uh, usually it's about a $20 bill. I set those out and I'll get some scrap lumber and I always have that around, but you can get that in, in, in their scrap lumber pile and, and, and a Home Depot or a Menards and, or, um, or a Lowe's, for example, uh, at a pretty good price, just to support the weight. Now, each of these 10-gallon totes, if they're filled to all 10 gallons, that's 80 pounds per tote, or 240 pounds sitting on this table. So that's why you want some boards to spread out the weight. Um, there's never, in my system, there's never 10 full gallons in here, but uh, you know, I, I need that airspace. So, but there's at least nine and probably eight gallons in here. And if you want to get fancy, just get a little um, tarp to protect the wood, and uh, and you're done. And these saw horses, you know, they, they just fold. They, they, you don't, there's no tools required, and, and so it's pretty pretty simple to do. Here are my roots. This is the uh, this is a photo of the very very first hydroponic project, if you will, or experiment, if you will, that I did uh, a couple years ago. It's basil, and I start the seeds. I started the seeds at Labor Day. And um, we started harvesting to make pesto roughly uh, the 1st of October. Um, and by Christmas time, okay, we had enough pesto and we had a lot of pesto because I had 36 basil plants. That's just a little overkill probably. Um, but anyway, we like pesto and I wanted to see what basil would do. And I was just kind of curious about the, what the root system would look like. These totes are 24 inches long, and as you can see here, each of the root systems are, in some cases, well beyond 24 inches. But it's a very extensive uh, root system. Um, so if you're wondering, gee, you know, how well do these plants do? They 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 do great. This is a escarole. You can see the uh, the green uh, kind of did something nasty here. You know, just ripped it out, uh, uh, ripped it off the cover here, just to show uh, the root system. But very extensive root system. Normally, this is the color that you want to see in most roots, normally. Basil, tip, at least the basil that I grow, Genovese, typically doesn't have a white root, but sort of a gray or very light brown root color, and that's okay. If you raise beets, if you raise red beets, the roots will be red. If you raise the golden or yellow variety beets, they will, the roots will be yellow. So it's kind of fun, again, if, if you're into this kind of thing, either with kids or, or, or um, I'm easily amused here. So, um, so I, I, um, I, I think it's kind of cool to see how these root systems grow in water, just a couple inches, and they're producing, um, in my case, the salad greens the entire summer. And by the way, um, just as an aside, um, I have I have a garden soil based garden. My garden is 30 by 50 feet. Um, I have at least 50 to 70 containers all in soil. So I so I got stuff all over my yard plus hydroponics. When I'm raising lettuces, however, salad greens, however, here as you see, well, maybe you can't see, but here is where uh, on the east side of my house uh, on my deck is where I want the lettuce because it gets the morning sun. And maybe sun till about noonish, and then as the sun, um, uh, you know, it turns into shade here on this part of the house, the plants do not bolt as quickly. They do not flower. They they this, they do not sour uh, or get as bitter as they would growing in in um, in the full sun. So I typically, if I set my plants out, let's say the middle of May or usually the first of May, but say the middle of May, I can harvest from one plant through usually the first part of August, maybe the middle of August, and then I then the plant really starts to look kind of ratty, and I say, okay, let's, you know, let, let me let me clean this out and get ready for the fall. So you can get a heck of a long harvest out of out of um, a, a single plant if that's what you want to do. 
ideally, if you can see the arrow here, and if you can see if if the water was at, let's just pretend, right at to the tippy top of the tote, notice how it's dropped down. So as long as the root system is at least at least a third of the root system, maybe as much as a half, but at least a third, if it's in the nutrient solution, you do not have to add more water. You, you never want to have a container filled with water in my system. This is a passive system. Now, if, if for those of you who have um, gone on the internet and there's lots of articles about hydroponics, uh, they almost always will talk about an active system. And there you need a, a pump and, a, and air bubblers or, or, or bubblers to pump in the air. And then you can have the water right up to, to the gunnies, uh, right up to the top. No big deal. In my system, nope. I'll, I'll have it uh, so the, the water is just touching just the bottom. Of the net pots, if uh, hopefully I, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but right at the uh, the bottom of the cursor, as the plant grows, sucks up the nutrient solution, as I said earlier, water level drops, air space uh, increases, plant does great. Indoors, this is the only time that I need electricity in my system because uh, I garden year round, and it's just a little difficult for me to raise stuff in January, February, March, you know, November, December in Minnesota. Um, so I raise a lot of stuff indoors, and what I do is just buy standard shop lights. Uh, now I'm using LED bulbs, but here you're seeing some of my older. Uh, uh, they're called T12 bulbs, the old fat uh, one-inch bulbs uh, that aren't very uh, efficient. But now uh, um, you know they're Almost everything is LED, very energy efficient. Um, but I've taken the lighting unit. I, I took it apart. I took the the where you see the lights. I took that down. That that just there's just one screw, a couple of screws there, and then I screwed the black part or the top part where the where the pull chain is and so forth to the bottom of a resin um, shelving unit. Um, you, I, I like these because they're 18 inches wide, uh, 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 three, uh, three to four feet long, and um, and they're lightweight and they're pretty cheap. And that's where I that's where I'll put my tote um, and the lights of uh, you know you know as you see in the on the right hand side or in the bottom. Uh, I might have uh, two lights um, because the, the the bigger lights aren't giving me the coverage that I want. And that's where I'll start my seeds or whatever. There are still some companies, uh, I believe, that you can find a nice wide lighting unit. And these are shop lights. Forget about buying lighting fixtures for hydroponics. Too expensive. You don't need it. And and you buy the, the stuff in a garden center or a big box store, Home Depot, Lowe's, and so forth. Uh, cheap. And they work terrific. And I've been doing this, um, I've been using these kinds of lights uh, since 1976 um, and with great results. And you can hang these babies um, with screws or, or light chains. Um, here in um, here in the Horse, uh, Horse Society, uh, the, the building that we, I am now in, um, Tom, um, one of the key people here, suspends these light units with bungee cords. No screws, no tools. It takes different different um, strengths of bungee cords. Just wraps it around the the, um, the lighting unit, hangs it from the, the the shelf, and he's done. I thought it was pretty darn clever, actually. I stole the idea. When you set the lights, I set them uh, about one to two inches above the seed uh, the seedling, at least initially. Um, I'd like to keep the lights low because it, that creates a, a nice strong leaf stem unit. I, mean, I don't get any spindly plants when, when I do that. Then, as the plants grow, you know, I might um, I might keep the lights about three inches above the top of the plant, um, but usually never more than that. You know, you know, fairly close. And again, these are fluorescent lights, shop lights, LED lights, whatever. They do not uh, give off a, a lot of heat. In fact, very little heat, so they don't burn the plant. Um, uh, you know, even even at one or two inches, so you're you're pretty safe doing that. 
talk a little bit uh, as we sum, summarize um, and, and close out this session. So there's some variations of hydroponics. All of these aquaponics, aeroponics, uh, aerial hydroponics are subsets, if you will, of hydroponics, um, and they're and they're pretty um, pretty popular, especially aquaponics. Uh, basically, um, this is a recycling of fish way uh, fish waste. It's a, much more complicated than what I've been talking about because you need a usually two tanks at least to have a true aquaponic system. The fish are in one tank. You put food in one end and out the other end comes a fertilizer, manure. That is transferred to the to the, the, the tank that you have the plants through a series of pumps and tubes. The plants take up that fertilizer, that manure. That's, what, that's how they grow. They clean the water and that cleaner water goes back to the fish. So it's a nice circle. The, the fish make a, make a mess. The mess goes to the plants, the plants clean, clean water goes back. So it works uh, works um, pretty neat. If you don't want to get involved in real aquaponics, if you're a purist and you don't want to fool with fish, I, I have uh, 10 water features in my yard. I have, I'm running now about 30 or so fish uh, in my basement. I, I, I bring them in uh, during the winter. But if you want to um, go the cheaper route, uh, and I tend to, kind of lean towards that direction. I buy a gallon of Fisher Motion um, wherever off the internet or wherever. Maybe it costs me a, a $10 bill for a gallon. It's it's concentrated, so I have to cut it. And I'll add just a little bit of that fish Motion to my hydroponic fertilizer if I want to add anything. I said earlier, you don't need to add anything. Uh, you know, if you're using a hydroponic fertilizer that's complete, you can still do that, but just for the heck of it, if for some reason you um, uh, you know you want to add fish emulsion, you know you can do that. Aeroponics, aerial hydroponics, um, probably as a homeowner, you're not going to be able to afford this because they're pretty expensive. They're still experimental, and basically what happens is you suspend the plant in the air, and through a, a timers and misters and, and and a series of of tubing tubes and pumps and so forth. That plant is sprayed with a nutrient solution. It's sprayed either constantly or periodically. And as I mentioned, uh, potatoes uh, growing in outer space, uh, you know, NASA's got, actually they're doing some ground-based experiments as well with different kinds of uh, vegetables, but potatoes seems to be the, um, the uh, variety of choice. Um, uh, they're doing that here. And in Sardinia, which is in, in the Mediterranean, <clears throat> they are able, before aeroponics, hydroponics, they were getting two crops per season. That's still pretty good. Here in Minnesota, typically we can only get one. Using this aeroponic process where they're misting, you know, say so the plant is suspended. It's not, not eat, it's not in water. It's not, uh, it's just hanging in the air and it's sort of a fog or a mist that sprays the, the, the root system. They get four crops out of it. And that's pretty impressive as far as I'm concerned. Aerial hydroponics, that's a, that's a blend. Uh, they suspend the plants, but now half of the root system is always in the water and the other half is uh, in the air. And, um, and, and sometimes they spritz the, the part that's in the air. Here's an example of what I, uh, um, uh, an aquaponic system can look like, you know, you've got, as I mentioned, just to illustrate this uh, a little bit. Here are your fish. Uh, you feed them. Uh, uh, their waste goes through a pump and a filter system, goes to your ta your your hydroponic tanks. The the root system systems uh, clean the water a little bit, and that clean water goes back. Uh, but it's higher maintenance. The the cycle takes a, a longer time than the nitrogen cycle takes up a longer. Uh, a time period, probably a couple months to, to get going. But once it gets going, uh, you know, you should be okay. Here's an example from NASA. Um, these, the, way at the top somewhere in this morass is was a potato eye and they spray it, as I mentioned. And all these little things, these little bumps, these are potatoes. Uh, potatoes growing, and what they're hoping for is um, that the astronauts can raise uh, potatoes, for example, in their space station, because hauling up water, hauling up soil is pretty heavy. 
and, and, it's, and it takes up a lot of space, obviously. Here they can suspend these babies and, um, you know, get a halfway decent crop. Uh, now, this, the, these potatoes aren't at maturity. And, you know, they're still pretty young. But as you can see, they're pretty prolific. I mean, uh, I raise potatoes, and I sure don't remember having this much volume, this much yield off a single eye uh, potatoes. But uh, So it's really kind of a cool thing. Closing out a little bit here, hydroponics and traditional farming me uh, methods. Um, not to get into a contest here, uh, but hydroponics is definitely much more sustainable because the carbon footprint, if you're concerned about the environment, is much lower. Uh, transportation costs uh, are shorter because here in Minnesota, here in the metro area, there are at least five or six, I believe, commercial hydroponic uh, uh, companies that are selling their produce and their fish, in some cases they, 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 they have aquaponics, to the local grocery stores. So we as Minnesotans, if we go to places like Kowalski or Buns and Lyre, or Byerly's and Lunds and so forth, and uh, a couple other uh, stores, we can get fresh vegetables literally picked that day or within a day or two versus having to be trucked in from California or Florida or Mexico or wherever we, uh, we bring them in. And, Yields are higher, shorter harvest time. Now, the energy use is much higher with indoor commercial hydroponics, um, but uh, those companies are getting around that apparently because they're now uh, installing renewable uh, energy sources, especially if, they're, if, they're, um, uh, if they have land. You know, they may have wind or solar, but um, in St. Paul, you know, they may have a solar uh, a bank on the roof or something. So, so they're trying to compensate for the energy costs by producing their own energy, if possible. Still no pesticides or herbicides. Water conservation, and, and these next two are pretty important from my point of view. You're using 90% less water compared to soil base because the water's in a bucket, say, or it's in a tube, say. It ain't going anywhere can't leak into the environment. There's no water runoff uh, uh, into your lake or your river or whatever. You know, it's right into, um, it's right into the bucket uh, or, as I said, the PVC container. So I think it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty cool that way. This, the, the nutritional value, I talked about taste and I talked about texture before, generally is the same. The nutritional value is exactly the same as soil-based greens because the soil does not add the, the nutrients. It's the genetic makeup, the DNA of that particular plant, of that lettuce, of that tomato, of that pepper variety. That's what uh, that's what uh, creates the nutrients in that particular product. So, um, so the argument, gee, soil-based greens are are, are, are are healthier for you or more more nutritionist for you than hydroponics. Um, that's a myth, that, if, or fake news. Larry, I'm yes, going to stop you for a second because we're almost out of time. I want to make sure we get time to answer a couple of questions. Sure. Th thanks. Sorry. <laughs> sorry no, so I'm sorry to, to call a halt to it. Um, we did have a few questions. Um, Kathleen wants to know how much, when, when you've started the seeds in the rock wool cubes, how much water does that need to sit in? Uh, you, you soak the rock wool cubes um, until you it changes color. In other words, you'll, you'll see it looking damp. Uh, and that's all the water that you need initially. You add the seed, and as long as those cubes uh, are, remain damp, they don't sit in water at all. Now, if, they, if they're starting to dry out, obviously you add water. But no, generally, you, you, you pre-soak the, the Rockwell cubes. Um, they'll go from a sort of a light tan to a medium dark tan, I suppose. And you add your seeds, and you're done. Okay, and uh, Dale wants to know, how often do you have to check the water level inside of your bucket and what temperature should the water be at when you add more? Yeah, good questions. Um, if we're talking indoors, um, the, the water temperature uh, is going to be the ambient temperature of, of your basement or wherever you're growing your, your, uh, your plants, so, so there's no problem there. Evaporation is, is very low. And as I was telling um, some of you earlier, um, I just I spent five weeks in Mexico, came back, I, I, and I had four tomato plants growing in, in, in six-gallon buckets. So I topped them all off. You know, they're all set before I left, and they're all about three or four feet high. When I came back, uh, there was only about an inch of water in that six-gallon bucket. 
but I was eating tomatoes. Now, the plants look ratty. I'll, I'll give you that. But it produced the fruit. So how often do you check? Um, if you're outdoors and it's very hot, as it was here in uh, the Minneapolis area uh, for a couple a couple weeks last year, I had to check every week because the tomatoes, for example, not so much lettuce, but tomatoes, peppers, they draw in a lot of nutrient solution. So I was checking every week. Um, I always add cold water uh, because, as I said, uh, cold water has uh, more oxygen in it, and um, and you should be good to go. If it's if the ambient temperature is in the mid to upper 70s or very low 80s, you should be able to um, be okay anywhere from two to three weeks without having to add or, I mean, you can check every day if you want to, but you, you, two or three weeks before you have to add any water. Temperature gets very high, then, you know, and, and your plants are in full sun, then, you know, you have to check more often. Great. And uh, Rochelle wants to know, where's a good source to get seeds if I want to start this now? Seeds? Um, yeah. Well, uh, I was just in Menards, uh, and they have seeds, and I think all the big box stores, Bachman's probably has uh, seeds available. If you if you you know if you want small volumes, or you certainly can go online, and um, I only get about 18 catalogs, and so I buy a lot of my seeds. Um, out of state because of the varieties that they offer. If you're looking for volume, if if you want to buy locally, um, and uh, and you, when I talk volume, these are a lot of seeds. I go to Jordan Seeds. In fact, I'll be going there this Friday. Jordan Seeds and Woodbury, and and they sell, for example, some varieties of lettuce for about two or three dollars a bag, and in that bag there's a minimum of 25,000 seeds. Now you compare that price with what you're gonna buy in a Bachman's or uh, in a catalog, you, you may get 100 seeds or so forth. So I, I usually give a lot of seeds away to my schools and, and, and uh, senior projects, so I like the volume. But you, 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 there are a lot of stores right now that ha have seeds uh, available. Great. And you, can start, and you can start right now. Unfortunately, our time is up. Um, I'm going to encourage everyone to take a look at Larry's book. Thank you very much, Larry. Thank you, everyone, for attending tonight's webinar on hydroponic gardening. Once thank you, leave, you. Thank you. Once you leave tonight's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and we would appreciate it if you would complete that and provide your feedback. You'll also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. On behalf of MSHS and our presenters, thank you for joining us tonight and have a great evening. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.